Hey legends and welcome back to the least knowledgeable sim racing channel where we're going to tell ourselves some nice self-affirming stories to feel warm on the inside. I was just watching the British GT Championship at Brands Hatch with a keen interest on how sim racing's golden boy James Baldwin was performing. To those who don't know, James recently won the world's fastest gamer competition which landed him a seat driving a GT3 car for Jensen Team Rocket. In his debut race, he and his teammate Michael O'Brien won at Alton Park. Imagine how absurd that is. You've raced video games your entire life, you land a gig racing an actual race car against professional drivers, and you're so well equipped that you're able to not only come to terms with the car and how it handles, execute the race strategy, but actually win the race. So when we got to the track on Friday, me and Michael, to be fair, we both have a lack of experience in uh, GT3s. Um, I think we said before we have a combined experience of 25 laps in the car. Uh, it's got to be some sort of record of the least experienced duo to ever go in British GT. This, however, is only the beginning of his saga. At the next race in Donington Park, James took pole position in qualifying. He drove the fastest lap in his first GT3 race at Donington Park against professional drivers who have been doing this for years. At this point, I couldn't even. The story at Donington, however, got very interesting and it revealed to me just how much of a role sim racing likely played in his preparation. See, as the race began, it also started to rain. James rapidly began dropping positions. Team orders were to just keep the car intact and safeguard whatever position he could. Ultimately, they dropped well down the order and didn't reach the podium. Guess what? None of the current top tier consumer simulators have very good adverse weather simulation, so James couldn't have prepared himself for that race in the same way he was used to. Jumping back to the near present, as I was watching the run up to the race at Brands Hatch, the camera focused on the RJN McLaren 720S and showed that James was driving the opening stint. The commentators made mention it was sitting on pole position, to which I completely laughed my butt off. See. I've been planning to do a video on this topic for months now and James has essentially given me a tremendous gift by being the direct case in point example of how games like ACC and R Factor 2 can actually prepare someone to be a real race car driver. I didn't just randomly pick those two sims by the way, James explicitly stated that those two were the ones which helped him prepare. So to all of you guys who are constantly waging that war in my comments and every time I mention ACC, the RF2 fanboys scrum on talking about how much it sucks, followed by the ACC gang stacking on every time I share good words about RF2, just stop. Stop. We live in the best period in history for racing simulation. At no point has it been as good as it is right now. In spite of all the minutia you might want to talk about, such as tire pressures not adding up, the feeling on the limit not being quite right, the car setups not equating one to one with real life, well, here you have a guy that's used those exact physics models to prepare himself to not only partake in the real thing, but to dominate at it. Yes, this is another one of those gratitude videos where I talk about how goddamn lucky we all are to live in a period where we can just enjoy one of our favorite hobbies from our homes and know that if we really wanted to take them to their limits, they just may equip us to be far better at the real thing. With the exception of flight sims, which other facet of gaming can claim the same thing? We are all, to a man, blessed. What James' story tells me is that after he attains a degree of veterancy and people see just what he's capable of when he's seasoned, a hell of a lot more teams are going to start recruiting directly from esports. It's one thing to scout and support a kid as he works his way up the motorsports ranks, gradually introducing him to all the circuits that he'll be facing in his chosen motorsport, and then providing him the expensive seat time to learn them. It's another thing entirely to take someone who has already driven tens of thousands of laps of every major race circuit in the world virtually. Sure, you have to take that person and condition them physically, get them used to all the forces the car will apply to their bodies and then also give them the time to translate what they know from force feedback to how a car signals its intentions in the real world. But which one do you think provides the far better return on investment for team management? Yeah. After the surge of the last few months, we're going to see continued growth in the hardcore sim racing industry, and people from real motorsports progressively taking it more and more seriously, especially as the physics models continue to get ever more complicated and complete. No thanks to Slightly Mad Studios. Sorry, sorry, I just had to. Back to the race at Brands. 
James went on to create a gap of 26 seconds to second place, as if racing against the field of AI set too low for his skill level, before the pace car came along and threw it all away. The team went on to lose two positions in the pits and finished second for the race, though by that point I'd lost all interest after the momentum was stunted by full course yellows. That's GT racing for you. I will concede that James usually does his stints when the amateurs are out on the field, so his teammate Michael arguably gets the harder side of the races. That said, his continual qualifying on pole position would indicate that he has the pace to outdo even the seasoned professionals in the series. What this goes to show is that in some sense, seat time in a real simulator can double back as a partial substitute for real seat time. Once your body accounts for the differences in feeling, everything else remains the same. Your brake points, your throttle inputs, your steering angles, those bumps you know to snap counter steer for because the car's weight balance suddenly shifts mid-corner on a given track. These are all things which sim racing clearly prepares you for. Oh, and to cap it off, James also got pole during qualifying at his first ever GT3 race at Alton Park, picking up a minor track limits violation which shot him down to fourth. So in a sense, he has qualified on pole for every single one of his first GT3 qualifiers he's done. They call top tier sim racers aliens, and I think the real world of motorsports is going to find out exactly why that is very soon. James, if you're watching this, know that there are those of us in sim racing following your rise through motorsports and cheering on your every small victory. To us, you represent not only the vindication for what we spend so much of our time doing, but you're a beacon as to the legitimacy of hardcore sim racing and what it might mean one day to motorsport as a whole. Be sure to hit that sub and ring the bell to be notified as we delve further into the worlds of both sim racing and motorsports. Until next time, we'll see you later.